Hola, bon dia, gràcies per ser aquí. Farem una sessió multilingüe. Estem en una universitat global i farem... Aquí sonaran avui quatre idiomes com a mínim. Jo seré molt breu. Vinc en representació del Festival de Cinema i Drets Humans de Barcelona. Un festival amb 100 anys d'experiència, modest, però ambiciós, diguem. Tenim una programació que comença avui fins al divendres que ve. Fa una cua el fi de setmana següent a Sant Feliu de Llobregat. Si algú va a Sant Feliu de Llobregat també pot tenir oportunitat de veure més pel·lícules. Intentem que sigui un espai de reflexió sobre els drets humans a través del cine, però també fem altres accions, fem taules rodones a Barcelona aquests dies, hi ha una programació molt completa que podeu consultar amb aquests folletons. I masterclasses amb universitats. Aquest any és la primera vegada que ho fem en aquesta facultat, ens fa moltíssima il·lusió, em sembla que el marc del màster d'estudis asiàtics i pacífic en un entorn global és un lloc ideal per portar el nostre convidat estrella d'aquest any, amb qui vam fer la inauguració ahir, l'artista dissident xinès Badiu Cao. Pràcticament no dic res més que convidar-vos a mirar, a consultar el programa, assistir, no sé, i difondre i assistir a les sessions que n'hi ha de força interessants. Passo la paraula ara a l'Alexandre, molt bé, que és el nostre host, diguem. Perdona, sí, ah, director de comunicació. Eh... Voy a hablar en castellano y los que no hablen en castellano, I, I will speak also in English, just uh, a few notes, okay? Uh, I talked with Buddy a few minutes ago. Um, for all the uh, master classes that we have here, uh, we will propose to the students or to public to uh, take note of the social media of the artists or filmmakers that will came to the master classes because we want to try like an exercise through the social media all our guests and also with our website and our social media. So at the end of the master class we will try to offer to anyone on the public to interact with us through small videos on Instagram or another kind of publications. For me it's really important that everyone understand that Badiukau is a great artist, not just politically involved, but also like a great, really refined person. And he's working a lot every day, talking about the Hong Kong uh, conflicts and, and other ones that he's supporting. But as artist, he's creating a lot, a lot, a lot of content, and he's for free and everyone could share that contents on social media to empower those movements all around the world. And for that, for me, it's really, really important that in this masterclass, everyone try to interact and to share, to empower the way he's giving for free the sale to the world, okay? Voy a decirlo en castellano. He hablado con, con, con Baducao hoy y es un ejercicio que queremos hacer con los estudiantes que, o gente del público que venga a, a las masterclasses. Para nosotros es muy interesante y es muy importante que hagamos este, este ejercicio para que conozcan por qué, por ejemplo, estoy cambiando el, el discurso, ¿eh? pero de todos modos lo voy a, voy a explicar la idea, no lo voy a hacer igual, porque estoy improvisando totalmente. Eh, quiero que entiendan que el arte de Baducao, mucha de la producción que él hace, como un disidente político, como una persona eh, comprometida con los movimientos sociales y los conflictos en Hong Kong y en otros lugares, lo hace gratuitamente. Él todos los días está trabajando, diseñando arte y cualquier persona puede copiar y puede compartir ese arte en donde quiera. Porque la potencia de las redes sociales, la potencia de, de los medios masivos de comunicación empoderan los movimientos sociales y las protestas y las reivindicaciones sociales en todo el mundo. Y para mí... Es necesario y es un honor que le hacemos al tratar de interactuar y compartir para no solamente 
eh, a través de sus manifestaciones, sino también a través de, de la fuerza que tenemos como sociedad para compartir esos contenidos. Entonces, haremos un pequeño ejercicio al final con redes sociales del festival y, y, y de él para que compartamos esos contenidos. ¿vale? Esto también será un ejercicio que haremos en todas las masterclasses. Es importante. ¿vale? Muchísimas gracias. Y ahora sí, pasamos la palabra y disfruten el masterclass. Um, well, um, since we have uh, three languages in this university, my intervention will be in English because we are trilingual. Um, I'm going to say a, a very short welcome words. Um, Badiou Kao, a Chinese political cartoonist and dissident artist, has become a keen observer of China and its political situation. Nowadays, he lives in Australia, and we want to thank him for delivering this opening lecture of our Master in Asian Pacific Studies in a Global Context, which offers a specialized training with a contemporary and interdisciplinary perspective to professionals and university graduates with different backgrounds and from a variety of fields. Certainly, as Bertolt Brecht once said, we are living in dark times. Anti-government protests have rocked Hong Kong for months and the situation shows no sign of dying down. Clashes between police and activists have become increasingly violent with police firing live bullets and protesters attacking officers and throwing petrol bombs. Far from there, in a place called Barcelona, young protesters blockaded the city's airport and fought running battles with police in the streets. Catalonia's drive for independence plunged Spain into its biggest political crisis for 40 years. In both cities, young people became actively involved in political activism. In this context of political turmoil, we celebrate that intellectuals and artists like Badiou Kao do not remain silent in the face of the violation of human rights, but rather express their commitment to democracy a system of government, of government which is clearly in danger in many parts of the world. Besides authoritarian governments in China or the Philippines, to cite a few, there's an increasing level of political instability spreading all over the world, and more recently over Latin America. On November 12th of this year, Bolivian Senator Janine Añez, a leader of the nation's right-wing opposition party, declared herself interim president of the country. The image of Senator Añez holding the four canonical gospels as she posed at the Quemado Palace in La Paz is particularly scary. Historically right and left wing extremism has severely repressed artists and intellectuals so that we all congratulate that their voices can still be heard. I want to thank Badikao for joining us in this tiempos recios, or harsh times, as Teresa de Avila once said, and also Tony Navarro and Uriel Porta for, uh, from the Festival de Cinem the Cinema y Derechos Humanos de Barcelona for making this possible. Um, and that's it. I just want to say it. And I am going to uh, pass the word to my colleague, José Luis Corazón, uh, who will introduce him um, as one of the China's most prolific and well-known political cartoonists in the last years. Thank you. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, yo simplemente quería hacer referencia a esta cara que está oculta en esa en esa imagen, ¿no? Que era la imagen de un artista que se le ha considerado como disidente, ¿no? Y entonces tenemos que ver qué significa qué significa esto. Etimológicamente, bueno, no vamos a ponernos muy estupendos, pero vamos a traer hoy dos etimologías y una de ellas es lo que significa la palabra personare, ¿no? la palabra persona, que es la palabra que se utilizaba en latín para hablar de la máscara. ¿no? Las máscaras se utilizaban no tanto para ocultar un rostro, sino precisamente para producir una imagen y lo que hacían era ocultar precisamente la voz, la voz propia, ¿no? la, la palabra persona, la máscara la, era personare, ¿no? para ser oída. ¿Cómo podemos comprender entonces que la función de un artista sea, por ejemplo, aparecer el mascarado? ¿no? Y que tenga que quitarse además esa máscara ¿no? para mostrarse de una manera más eficiente. 
Bueno, eso nos dirigiría un poco a saber cuál es el Estado o cuál es el espacio, no solamente de la política, ¿no? porque es inevitable pensar que un artista eh, que se considera disidente, que está en un forzado exilio, que está padeciendo eh, la situación, vamos a decir, no solo ideológica, sino política, ya marca que el arte salga del propio espacio autónomo del arte, con sus problemáticas, ¿no? y se lance un poco a comprender qué significa el arte dentro de la realidad, ¿no? que este sí que es uno de los planteamientos importantes. ¿no? Cuando consideramos que el arte no es simplemente una cosa para hacer exposiciones en galerías y museos, sino que también tiene que ver con la exploración del presente, cuando tiene que ver también con la denuncia de los derechos humanos, cuando tiene que ver con la libertad de expresión. Es decir, cuando el arte se convierte en un espacio que aglutina toda esa defensa de la opinión, ¿no? podemos decir. Bueno, eh, vamos a hacer otra etimología que tiene que ver con la palabra disidencia. La palabra disidencia tiene que ver con la palabra deseo, ¿eh? tiene que ver con este espacio donde nos sentimos abandonados, donde nos sentimos a la espera de algo que va a ocurrir y en ese sentido pues podemos decir que los artistas no se limitan a ser simples contempladores, ¿no? sino que se dedican a, a introducir cambios o se dedican a mostrar la realidad desde un punto de vista. Claro, en el caso de la actualidad, pues la realidad supera a la ficción, ¿no? Estamos asistiendo últimamente a, a este tipo de, no sé si de denominarlo revueltas, pero sí estos movimientos sociales que no solamente se están dando en Barcelona, ¿eh? que se están dando a día de hoy en Santiago de Chile, en Ecuador, en Hong Kong, en Irán. Es decir, que este clima de revuelta, el artista no lo debe utilizar, o los artistas, mejor dicho, porque también hay mujeres que están sufriendo este, este exilio, ¿no? un exilio que en China eh, viene de antiguo. Aquí habría que mencionar las la, alguna de las acciones que Badiucao ha llevado a cabo, por ejemplo, frente a la Mona Lisa, ¿no? recuperando el espíritu de aquella carta que escribió Oron, <coughs> lo que se denomina la disidencia china, que englobaba no solamente a artistas, sino a personas dedicadas a la investigación universitaria, a intelectuales, a profesores. Es decir, a cuando, vamos a decir, la parte intelectual o la parte cultural de una sociedad decide estar en desacuerdo con, con cuestiones que afectan a los cambios, ¿no? que afectan a, a estas transformaciones. Bueno… Eh, el arte que practica Badiucao tiene, una, tiene algunas particularidades, porque si bien en la modernidad el artista parecía como esa figura genial que hacía cosas y solía ser masculina y que hacía cosas maravillosas donde podíamos estar ante el genio, eh, en el siglo XXI ya no tiene eso ningún sentido. Es cierto que las obras de arte se pueden valorar por los precios, por sus costes, etcétera, por su parte económica, inevitablemente, pero ¿qué ocurre cuando el arte sale de ahí? y ya se propone no como una cosa que es la actividad de un solo, una sola persona, personare, sino que eso se comparte. En ese sentido, la obra de Badiucao, pues tiene algunas, algunas señales de que el arte ha dejado de ser lo que era para ser otra cosa. ¿Qué ocurre cuando un artista propone que su obra sea expandida, sea colaborativa, sea... Eh, utilizada por las personas para, en beneficio propio o en beneficio de los demás. Es decir, cuando el arte se propone también como una forma de participación. Eso sí que es importante, ¿no? que ahora cada uno podamos hacer la guerra por nuestra cuenta, digamos, pero eh, siempre partiendo de una idea que lleva a, eh, a ver también la incidencia que tienen las redes sociales ¿no? en el arte contemporáneo. Cuando el arte contemporáneo deja de ser algo más que un meme y se convierte también en un lugar de exposición de compartir, de comunicación. ¿Y qué ocurre cuando esas ganas de comunicar topan con la censura, con el castigo, con la venganza y con aquellos sentimientos que al artista no le, no les, no le sientan muy bien, digamos? ¿no? En alguna ocasión eh, se dijo, a un poeta le preguntaron que cuál era el mejor, su mejor poeta, que cuál era la persona que más le había influido, el poeta era Paul Eloy, y él contestó que el mejor poeta que conocía era aquella, aquella persona que le llevaba a escribir versos a otra. ¿no? 
No sé si hasta qué punto la, el artista aspira, o Baduicao en este caso, aspira a que todo el mundo colabore con su visión, pero que sí que, colabore, que, sí que al menos tenga a su, a su mano, ¿no? que tenga a mano, algunas de estas formas de integrar el arte en la sociedad, bien a través del graffiti, bien a través de, de distintas performances, etc. Esa plaza pública que, que desgraciadamente estuvo en el origen ¿no? de, la, de la trayectoria de Baduicao, que tiene que ver con los episodios de la plaza pública de Tiananmen, ¿no? ¿de qué manera se pueden recordar hoy? ¿O sirve de algo eh, comparar aquellos tiempos con, con los que ocurren ahora? ¿Hay algún paralelismo que podamos encontrar en esta relación entre el arte y la revuelta? Pero en el fi al final del todo, no creo que, que Baduicao sea precisamente un artista tan incómodo, ¿no? ¿Cómo podemos darle tanta importancia a un artista que simplemente utiliza carteles, que utiliza materiales ecológicos también, como se ve en su película? Es decir, ¿qué es lo que molesta a esos sistemas coercitivos de la obra de los artistas? ¿no? Y aquí, por, a, por ampliarlo... También, no, no, no sé, los escritores también se dedican a papel y lápiz, digamos, ¿no? Es decir, ¿qué es lo que tiene la obra de arte o qué tiene la visión crítica de un determinado estado de cosas para que se lleve a que un artista sea exiliado, para que un artista sea vigilado y para que un artista pues, no pueda desarrollarse en su propio, en su propio país como, como persona, ¿no? Al fin y al cabo, esa máscara que que no sé si habéis visto la película, pero si tenemos la oportunidad de verla, pues bueno, vais a ver que eso forma parte muy importante del proceso que ha llevado a que un artista se tenga que ocultar para que de repente siga con más firmeza, una vez quitada esa máscara, ¿no? y mostrando también la, pues esta especie de, de ataque o de esta especie de, de rechazo que se encuentra por parte de, vamos a decir, de las visiones oficiales, ¿no? Otra cosa que me gustaría remarcar ya para terminar, porque creo que lo importante de hoy es que también el propio Baduicao nos exponga sus ideas o nos exponga su experiencia, que eso también es importante, me gustaría decir que es útil ¿no? que, la, que en una facultad o que en una universidad pues también confluyan estos intereses que tienen que ver no solamente con el arte, es decir, con el cine, con los documentales, sino que tenga que ver también con los derechos humanos, ¿no? porque ahí el arte va a saltar de su parte más, vamos a decir, condicionada por no intervenir en las cuestiones ideológicas o en las cuestiones políticas o en las cuestiones económicas, cuando precisamente las obras de arte conllevan también eso. ¿De qué manera, qué manera tienen ahora los artistas para intervenir en la, en la sociedad? ¿Qué, ¿Qué espacios urbanos o qué espacios ideológicos eh, los artistas van a, van a, van a, van a hacer existentes, no?, eso es lo importante. ¿Puede el arte incidir en el presente? ¿Puede el arte ser una manera, esa manera crítica? ¿Puede el arte eh, sobrevivir en espacios como, por ejemplo, las redes sociales o Internet? Pero también utilizando ese tipo de mecanismos aprendidos en el siglo XIX, ¿no? Cuando el arte, la revuelta, eh, invocaban no solamente a, a la acción a la acción literaria, ¿no? El propio, un poeta moderno como Malarmé ya dijo que el poema era la auténtica bomba, ¿no? ¿Qué quiere decir que un poema, que la obra de arte sea bombas? Exploten en nuestras mentes, ¿no? Nos lleven, a, nos lleven un poco a recuperar esa mirada que el arte poseía, no, no, no viendo la realidad como algo a copiar, sino un lugar donde se puede incidir. En este sentido, pues sí que es cierto que... que Definir un artista simplemente como, como arte político, pues eso se da por supuesto, ¿no? porque el arte es una cosa social, el arte necesita también ser mostrado y quizá ahí la cosa bascula no solamente de eh, los espectadores ¿no? que ven el arte como algo bonito o como algo bello o como algo interesante, sino cuando interviene directamente en nuestras vidas. Eso hace también que el arte se, nos convierta a nosotros también en ciudadanos y ciudadanas, ¿no? que nos convierta también en personas que somos conscientes de que hay que hacer autocrítica, de que también tenemos derecho a pedir derechos humanos, que también tenemos derecho a pedir libertad de expresión, que también tenemos derecho a pensar, porque realmente es tan fácil como, no sé, escuchar a, escuchar a todos, ¿no? En ese sentido, creo que, bueno, voy a dar paso a Baduicao 
y incidiendo ¿no? en esta idea de que todavía quedan lugares para unir el arte, los derechos humanos, la universidad y estos espacios propicios a pensar un poco, no solamente eh, a escuchar al artista que nos cuente su propia experiencia, sino para hacernos compartir nosotros también sus ideas. Así que, os doy paso a Radio K. Uh, all right. Thanks for everyone coming. Um, well, I realize that uh, we don't really have a big number here. So maybe the first thing that I want to say is, if you are students in this classroom, now take your mobile phone out, text your classmates, get them here. Um, secondly, I think uh, it's really a privilege to be here to talking with you guys. And I realize for this class, actually, there are a lot of students from mainland China, just like me. Um, I really cherish this opportunity to actually having a possibility to talking with young people from China because I were you guys. I, 10 years ago, I went to Australia from mainland China uh, to seeking a different life, uh, to having the opportunity to see things differently, to learn things differently. Um, and I feel this journey is very rewarding. Uh, and I do hope uh, that now you're studying outside of China will bring you some different kind of understanding of our motherland. And maybe this will be the key uh, to help China to be a better country in the future. Um, I think the film, the film itself is very much illustrating who I am. Uh, so in order to not doing too much of the spoiler uh, of the film, I shouldn't really talk too much before you uh, viewing it. But there's one thing that I particularly want to say, uh, especially from the first teacher, he mentioned the situation in Hong Kong. And I realized this is a very common way to phrase it, to saying, oh look, the violence is escalating, the situation is getting worse. Uh, there are violence from both sides, but this is just the appearance of it. We will have to find the root of why the situation happened, why the violence is escalated. And, we're, and we, we, when we are comparing the violence, is it really comparable between the force of the police and the force of the protesters? Thinking about the weapon that they have, thinking about the number that they have, I think it's not comparable. In 1989, are we really calling the students in China riots when they are facing tanks? In 2019, now the police force, they might not, they might have not sending the tank on the street, but their gear is super powerful. Compared with maybe some of the so-called petrol bomb, some of the brakes, the police has the full force. They have the guns, they have the tear gas, they have the beaten stick, everything they have. So I do want to emphasize on this that when we're talking about the violence, especially within protests, not just Hong Kong, probably also here, we need to be very careful about saying there are violence from both sides because it's, it, it is not comparable and we need to find the root of it um, I think now I will giving the time to the documentary first, so I don't repeat myself too much, uh, and you will see a lot uh, via this documentary. And after this, uh, I will give a little bit more information about my understanding of Hong Kong and how my art can be a part of the entire movement. So let's enjoy the film first. And do text your classmates coming. Okay. <laughs>
dead resist the tanks. The tanks tried again to move and were halted by their lone tormentor. Chinese artist Ba Ju Chao, who disguises himself out of fear of reprisals from the Chinese government, has called on people all over the world to recreate the image. The single biggest national security threat is China. This would be a kind of test. Uh, a first time that my work actually entering a Chinese territory. We shall see the reaction from the Chinese government. You've got to make a decision about the exhibition. Yeah, what's going on? I think he's fucking terrified. I don't know his name or who he is. I've ne never, no, no, never no, 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 no. And neither do we. you if you were married could you answer that question no where your parents live would you be able to tell me no which university you studied in australia could you tell me no why is your identity concealed it's not because i want to create another banksy it's more crucial for me that i have to protect myself um, from the possible hunting by the Chinese government. They will not just harm me, but also the one that I loved, my family. Are you confident that the Chinese authorities don't know who you are? Uh, well, I wish I could say yes, but the real answer is I don't know. to China's decision to remove presidential term limits from the Constitution, allowing Xi Jinping to remain in power indefinitely. China correspondent Bill Bertels. This does put Xi Jinping on the same pedestal as Mao because it wasn't just the term limits uh, that were abolished yesterday. Xi Jinping's ideology was written into the national constitution. It's clear let's go. Let's go. What is the picture you've done? It's showing how Xi Jinping is going to be a lifelong leader even after he died. No free speech, no access to information. He's cracking down on human rights lawyers, artists, medias. With his policy, whole China is moving to this digital dictatorship. He's expanding overseas, around the world. Um, being more and more aggressive. It works pretty well. But today I don't think anyone will touch us, so tomorrow we will be ready for the Chinese students. Oh, just for the record, this is PVA glue, so it's non-toxic. Very environmental friendly stuff. It is the best time when I can truly be myself within my art. For that's the moment that I can be completely free and forgetting all the struggling in my daily life. So normally people think art is about the gallery, about canvas, but in a contemporary sense, how you get your image to the outside world. I was in a university in China, and my friend downloaded a movie. We just started to watch it. But out of a sudden, the movie turned into a documentary about Tiananmen Massacre. <laughs> Oh, 
And when we finish it, we are all like frozen in front of the screen. And we look into each other and to be honest, we don't know what to say. Our first thought is, is it even true? Hospital orbs are running out of space. These tanks have just provided an escort for about 30 troop trucks. I was really shocked when I found out the truth of the Tiananmen movement. I'm shocked that this has been entirely erased from history. Only one brave protester there resist the tanks. The tanks tried again to move and were halted by their lone tormentor. If I imagine my future in China, I feel like it's suffocating. I can't really breathe with knowing that my rights and my freedom will be eaten away by society like that. That was the moment I realized I have to leave China if I wanted to live without all this fear. So in 2009, I moved to Australia. I became an Australian citizen. And it's the first time I start to feel I'm a free man and I'm free to create artworks about China. It all started as like a hobby. Coming to do an interview, my name is Badu Tao. I then did one piece of street art in Melbourne that would really bring the world's attention to my art career. If you go just south of Chinatown in central Melbourne, there is a little cobbled street, more of a back alley really, covered in graffiti. Nothing particularly unusual about that. But this year, there was one drawing that attracted a fair bit of attention. It showed a man and a woman embracing each other. The man is the late Lia Zhaobo, a Nobel laureate and Chinese dissident. This drawing appeared just two days before his death. The woman is his widow, Liu Jia, who hasn't been seen since his funeral. The artist behind it is one of China's most prolific and provocative cartoonists. Liu Xiaobo is like Nelson Mandela in China. He's the leader for the Tiananmen movement in 1989. In 2010, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his continuing fight for Chinese democracy. He couldn't go to the Nobel ceremony because he's in the prison. I made my Liu Xiaobo cartoon and posted it online and make it free for anyone to download and paste it on the street. And it went global after that. Two days after, he passed away. We, we just saw a, a life being turned off in this brutal way. And, and people are not even allowed to memorize him. I now know a bit about you. There's a lot I don't know. I don't know your real name. I don't know your age. I don't know where your family are, etc. But I know, obviously, <laughs> I know who you are. Yeah. How many other people in Melbourne know who you are? I said probably no one. Twitter now. Hey, I'm good. Sorry, I can't really see well, okay. but um, yeah. Let me introduce you, Carlos and Badio Tao. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, How are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. Wow, your life. that's fantastic. Your life. Book 35 years. Did you ever meet any of the cartoonists in Australia? When you were there? Um, not really. Yeah. I've been very cautious about meeting yes, people. Of uh, I do. On the other hand, I do want to 
you know, make friends. It's very yeah. important. Even here, I can't show you my face. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That's, the, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really the, the difficulty that I'm of course, facing. Of course, yeah. yeah, of course. Changes that I would like to see both in our society and other societies won't happen in my lifetime. The best you can do is put the seeds in the ground for, for it possibly to happen yeah. later. Yeah. And that's the best you can do. So welcome to my two guests today. I'm Rosie Bloor. I'm the editor of 1843. So Bad Liu Tao is a political artist from China. Bad Liu Tao now lives in exile, but as we'll talk about, his subversive work still circulates in China. Who do you really want to be seeing your cartoons? All my work is basically has no copyrights. So everybody is welcome to download and share in their individual level. So a lot of people on Twitter um, actually download my work and repost inside of China um, on you know, social media like WeChat. But obviously, um, it, it will be deleted very soon. And sometimes they're facing a very hard consequence, like their, their account can be suspended. They can be invited to the police station to drink tea. Um, <laughs> you keep harking back, particularly to 1989 and Tiananmen Square. Explain to us why you think it's so important to keep putting those images in front of people. The image that I want to use a lot is, is the tank man. For me, it's really a symbol or totem for the Chinese dissident. And that's, I think, is something that China needs. It's something that I personally need. Have you drawn a cartoon that you regret or that you now consider a mistake? Yeah, all the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually learning how to see this. Thank you. No, no. It was a very fast talk, quick talk. I feel like uh, I could go for another hour, I don't know. <laughs> Single biggest national security threat is China. This is the reality of President Xi Jinping's China, and they don't want the rest of the world to see. China is running a well-organized network of internment camps. Some say gulags, and they're growing fast. Rewards for good behavior and punishments for bad. The world's first digital dictatorship. Freshly delivered cartoon yes, for the yeah. first time. I know. Right. Hand delivered for yeah. the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real sense exactly. of meeting my editor. <laughs> But I want to show you something sure, now. Sure, that would be great. So we are uh, um, monitoring the gray firewalls technology and the content they block. We all know that uh, Tiananmen massacre happened 29 years ago is the most taboo uh, 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 for the Chinese authority. Right? Right. In this list, you'll see that gray firewall blocked 31 the Tiananmen-related keyword phrases. So it's not only just the Tiananmen, June 4th, 1989, the words you cannot use. In the past years, at the night of June 4th, mm -hmm. that word, even the people say today, that word, very word today is being blocked. Why? Because if you search the word today, the search results will show people actually talking about the events. Your work is a typical uh, what do we call the resistance discourse that hitting very hard on the Chinese regime, uh, on their legitimacy, on their hypocrisy, belongs to the category that the Chinese censor wants to delete the most. Australians living in a free society should not allow ourselves to be bullied into silence by an autocratic foreign power. This particular news just oh, popping out, I think it's crucially important. Again, reflecting the situation of free speech in Australia that being compromised by China. So in this cartoon, I'm going to bring the koala as the uh, symbol for Australia, but also panda, the symbol for China. Just imagine there's a huge panda holding a brush and it is going to transform the little koala into the panda-like. 
it will be good to print it out and actually put it on the street uh, in Melbourne. The reason why I'm trying to do the paste up instead of uh, using the spray can to do it publicly is because it will take longer and it means I'll have to take more risk. Being an artist like this is also a journey to recovering my courage. The more you do, the more dangerous it could be, but also the braver you become. What you reading, buddy? I'm reading President Xi Jinping's Governance of China. It's a book that probably most of the Chinese have to have and, and, and read. It's a, it's a new version of Mao's little red book. It's a big white book, yeah. It, are you afraid of him? I don't think he's a man play with any moral compass. So that's why he's dangerous. He looks like on the picture like a nice enough guy. Yeah, over photoshopped, you know, this nice skin. I can't stop imagining his face being replaced by Winnie the Pooh. Uh, the mailbox is unlocked. Just your mailbox? <laughs> yeah, just my mailbox. A and did that have your real name on? Uh, yeah. So were you pretty worried by that? Yeah. Do you feel safe? Uh, that's, never, that's never how I feel. I've received life-threatening messages over the internet. Do you think these are China government employees? Yeah. I'm worried that my art will put me and the people I know into danger, but I'm also worried that if I choose to be silent and live a comfortable life, I will regret in the rest of my life. How much of an issue then is this in your own family dynamic? I guess I don't want to talk about my family. I'm now working on my first solo exhibition in Hong Kong. It is really exciting because it's the first time I can get my work back to China. So how much of a risk are you prepared to take for your art? I think for the Hong Kong show, there will be the biggest risk I ever take. Tiger chair is a nickname for a torture chair that has been widely used with the Chinese police force. So this work is just simply me buying this chair from China and moving it to Hong Kong. Uh, they also sell wooden ones, you know. If you want it more fancy, <laughs> you can buy a leather one. <laughs> it's like a Walmart in the hell. So that's the poster. Xi Jinping's face combined with the current leader of Hong Kong. Yeah. She's a woman. I mean, no one's going to be confused about what you're on about, are they? Uh, I hope they don't. <laughs> it's kind of asking for trouble. Are you worried about reports about Chinese spying in Australia? Yeah, it means anyone in Australia can be a target, and I don't particularly feel safe as before. I've also been offered a job for working 
with Ai Weiwei in his studio. So I've made a decision to leave Australia. With everything going on, I'm relieved. I've been offered this job in Berlin. Good 相当于我就失去了故乡的人These are all materials that are starting to arrive for the Hong Kong exhibition. Yep. This is like my uh, treasure box. <laughs> Christmas time. So this is your Lu Xiaobo Lu Shua cartoon? Yeah. He was a leader in Tiananmen Square, right, Lu Xiaobo? Yeah, he was one of the main leaders in Tiananmen Square. The light is also a metaphor. The very gesture of putting the light on in a dark room. So do you want to continue doing art about them? Even, I mean, obviously he's dead. She's under house arrest. Yeah, absolutely. To me, in fact, my artwork is a way to record the history. And that's important because what Chinese government is doing is that they rewrite the history for their benefit. And that's a betrayal of its people. This is your first exhibition as well, right? Yeah, this is going to be my first solo exhibition. This would be a kind of test, uh, a first time that my work actually entering a Chinese territory. We shall see the reaction from the Chinese government. So these are also for the Hong Kong exhibition? Yep, they are. Is this the tank from Tiananmen Square? Yeah, that's the tank man here. Though there are also tank men, these are the young generation of the tank men that carry on the spirit. What about you? Are you, are you in the spirit of tank man? I think I'm definitely one of the young people on the tank at the moment. I actually have a tank man tattoo on my arm. I put it on my right arm, the arm that I used to draw as a reminder. I hope I can have his courage. If you, if you could go tomorrow and tell your family, mm. I am the artist Buddy Altel. I hope they will understand me because according to our family history, this is not a new thing. My grandparents, they are the first generation of the filmmaker in China back in 40s and 50s. He got into trouble during the anti-intellectual movement. He was sent to a rural concentration camp and died there. I am inspired by what happened to my grandpa. That made me want to be an artist now to address the same issue. Oh, come on. We learn how the AI is recognized the face through the uh, structure of the eye, nose, and mouth. We're gonna cover my nose and mouth completely from my mask, so I need to stitch them together. There's a bit of a metaphor in what you're doing. 
I mean, how far is this going to go, right? First mm. you had a mask, and now you've got it with a mouth and a nose, now you've got a mask with no mouth and nose. Yeah. Are you then going to have to have a mask without eyes? Yeah. And then is there going to be a technology that can take the shape of the head of the mask? I mean... Yeah, possibly. So you're probably feeling more secure, but how are you going to breathe in there? Oh, well, we can still breathe, because this is like swimming suit material, but it's just going to be warm. Isn't this very close shot? Too close for you? Yeah, I don't know. I really feel like it's all on my face. The idea of delivering words in the real world always interests me. So by just being a cartoonist and drawing behind screen and posting things online, is basically just not enough for me. Tomorrow will be the anniversary for the Tim Massacre. And I am going to, well, introduce the Tankman performance. And not just me, but also there are a lot of volunteers, activists, or normal people are doing the performance all around the world. I'm spray painting the planes into white. So, they're telling you it's an artwork. So, um, this is the uh, website page for the Tankman performance. It is clearly listing when you should do it, where you should do it, what do you need to wear. And successful uh, performance is not just about the action in the real world, but also um, the poster and sharing after the performance. Uh, I designed um, the uh, hashtag for it because hashtag is very important for people who want to search um, the similar topic. The whole formula of performance is really simple. The people cosplay the tank men in, from 1989. Uh, all they need to do is just dress up like him with a white shirt, black pants, and black shoes. And they also need to hold in two bags. And that's mm. it. Have you not ironed before? Uh, no. In the real life, I'm not really a, a, a shirt guy. You wish Tank Man had worn a t-shirt? Yeah. It was an iconic symbol of resistance in China, an unknown man with the shopping bag standing in front of several tanks in Tiananmen Square. On the 29th anniversary of the massacre, Chinese artist Ba Ju Chao, who disguises himself out of fear of reprisals from the Chinese government, has called on people all over the world to recreate the image using the hashtag tank man. Come on. Five minutes. Come here, I'll tell you why I'm doing it. Thank you so much. They're standing on your plinth. That's how absurd this is. Yeah. 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 Yes, that 29th the anniversary oh. of Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square? Oh. Yeah. Tiananmen. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you there? Oh. It's a protest. I can't understand why you should do something like this here. And it is not allowed to, to take pictures, okay? I protest. This is one of the former student leaders from 1989 doing the performance. Um, he was on the fifth of wanted list in 1989. So he was the fifth most wanted person in China in 1989. They had a list. So why is he standing there and his face is fully exposed? You're sitting here and you can't even breathe. He is one of the most wanted men already. For 29 years, you tell me. I 
have to keep so much within that I can't share everything with the one that I'm close to because it's dangerous. So in that sense, I'm really lonely. I do feel quite depressed time to time. But fortunately, art is a method to rescue myself. So let's call Tom about Hong Kong, because yeah. I've got a few concerns about Hong Kong. Hey Tom, how are you? Hey, how are you? Wow, oh, good. Hear your voice after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever spoken before? No, no. I have no idea what it looks like even, <laughs> let alone his name or anything. Um, so suitably mysterious um, to me and the team. How is this going to work? Is Buddy, are you announcing in advance that Buddy's going to be there or...? But we certainly, I think, in the next fortnight, need to start getting out a poster event stuff. I think I, I would, like, personally, I would feel more comfortable that uh, um, there's no pre-announcement that I will actually, there's no... In Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah. How risky is it for us to come to Hong Kong? Had you be going to the mainland, I would be like... <laughs> but, you're, you know, you're coming to, to Hong Kong, and I, I don't think there's... There's anything to be concerned about. As long as I'm not going to end up like Liu Xia in the house arrest situation or disappeared, then I would like to go. The Chinese authorities say Liu Xia is a free woman. This is what happens when you try to visit her. You no for that. We're trying to get to Liu Xia's home, which is where she has been held under what amounts to house arrest for the last seven years, despite never herself being convicted or even accused of any crime. She has been through hell. And at this moment, I think she needs more attention from the world. I did the, a body of the post called Hers Liu Xiao, which is modifying seven of the very famous painting in the history. They are featuring female. And my plan is to hold it side by side against the original. Hey, what is that? Now I have my tank woman, tank man in yes. the same room. <laughs> what I really like with your campaign is that you always make it very like DIY for anyone to use. Like the street art thing, the new shovel paste art. It was just amazing. I had nothing to do. I just need to print and cut and that's it. Like you even gave the recipe for the, uh, for the, the glue. glue yes. yeah. You will be getting inside the museum on a, another aisle and so you will have to to walk a little bit more to, to get to, to Mona Lisa. He's a bit stressed, so we're not going to be able to film any of the makeup. Because he's worried about time and not knowing how to put it on. We can see you getting changed. What can we not see? No. Because of the identifying of your yeah. body, basically. Yeah, I'm worried about trying to see parts of my body. Okay, all right, fine. So, um... Well, what we can do is, if we just focus on the leg, then you can see the dress dropping off. Yeah, or going over the head. It won't go over the head, because it will make the makeup. Okay, so over the shoulders, yeah. coming over, okay? <laughs> to wear a hot hat in the museum? No. Doing performance art is basically a new experiment field for me. It definitely brings more challenge for me because it forced me to actually enter a public space and showing in front of the people. What's up, man? Hey, hey, hey! Oh, 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 oh
Hello. Do you think the Chinese authorities know who he is? They know everyone now. This is the hugest uh, high-tech dictatorship of the 21st century. We were speaking about going to Hong Kong to participate to some artistic things, and I, I'm not sure that Hong Kong is safe anymore because some people were abducted uh, from Hong Kong by the Chinese government. Obviously, making my art known in Europe is very important, but I also want to find out what's going on in America. <笑>我跟你讲啊你好 既然吃素还要做成排骨药<笑> 而且是非常糟糕的窝头回到西安就是过了大概一个星期就看到那个通缉令哎呦 6月4号的上午4点多钟 
当我们我这一段队伍刚拐向这个西长安街的这个拐口，嗯，的时候、嗯，突然从身后这个毒毒气弹，那个时候大概已经有六点钟，哦，不是，它就是含氯气成分的战场禁用的毒气弹，哦、属于属于化学武器。对，它毒气弹的一爆炸，那么正好在我们身边就有嘛。和其他地理学生也有跑的，就互相就开始惊慌，就就大家就四处逃散逃散。但我身边这个女孩，她当时就晕倒了，不可能弃之不顾啊，就是很简单，就想把她扶起来。很短的坦克就，就这个时候就看到，坦克，所以当时就把她往那个栏杆使劲靠，嗯，自己就倒到地上，然后这时候坦克咵就从身上压过去，就是先是感觉是被拖。嗯，说可能就是那个履带，那时候我还有意识，就滚到路边，靠在栏杆上，然后才失去意识。照片，不是他们拍的在那个包里。北京市西城公安分局的一块就做了笔录，所以最早这些记录，就是我的这些经历是在那里，但是紧跟着回去以后，他就开始有各种压力，就要求你闭口。不要谈这个事实，嗯，就不要谈，就是你你你只要不说是坦克压的，这事儿都好说，嗯，就是中共他要用各种方式抹去这种记忆，最关键的就是所有的目击者，嗯，和甚至受害者，受害者都被禁止再提这个事情，他的家人等等都被晋升。就是根本的一个。明年都三十周年了，然后过了非常长的时间。是很多人慢慢的就老去了。对，共产党的想法。对啊，这个反正你们比较遗憾，老死了就完了。对对。穿一个六四纪念衫都要会被抓。嗯。老师在课堂上只要提这个，说不定就可能被，被举报、被丢掉教职，对对吧？然后你的网络全面封锁，那面对的这么一种状况下，就是年轻人很多人忘了。不敢谈了，他们的家长、他们的上一辈也不愿意去说了，他们可能根本不知道。整体性的遗忘，整体性的去选择性的去遗忘，去过掉。对我来说感触非常的深，然后呃，我是很荣幸。<笑>好，好好，特别感谢,谢,谢你，谢谢谢谢。好，好，希望有有机会再来。好。Free Press, Free Expression Week. The media so far, we have BBC, Vice, Time Magazine, AFP, South China Morning Post, which is Hong Kong media as well. The response to it has been phenomenal. And Gongul means, remind me, our song of the Communist Party. Yeah. So it's a play on words. Why did they say he came up on some list? And he couldn't get. We couldn't insure him. Yeah, you're on the so, list. Yeah, they did say that、um, you came up on the list. What、well, list?、Um, But your artist name came up on one of the insurance lists as someone who shouldn't be insured. So who are the other guys? Superman or Batman? <laughs> What's the naughty list? I don't know, but you're on it. All right. I spoke this morning. To a lawyer consultant, and he specialises in high-risk filming scenarios. With the media release out there and the show known, it's a big sign. Come and get me. Anything around the location or any time around the time is high risk. Correct. Because that's the open information. That's where the authority will be looking at. If they want to come in, they can come in. They do that. They go in. They just take people. Two big questions:、yeah. Do you one personally have to set up the exhibition, and two, do you have to be at the exhibition? I I want to go, of course. 
I mean, after all, I'm an artist, and this is what my work is for. It's a matter of how much of a risk you're prepared to take. Right. Can I share something private? Yep. Yeah. Kill the sounds. You've turned off sound? That's a game changer for you. Yeah. Everything changes for you then. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Tom, it's Danny and Buddy. So there's some things oh, we can't go into now over the phone, but how do we put this, Buddy? There is a possibility that my identity has been compromised in a way. By well, in recent weeks or? Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. I see. So I just have to re-evaluate the whole risk of being in Hong Kong. Explicit threats or something? This isn't China, for a start. At the very maximum, someone would be sent um, to, to, to check it out or to take photos. That's all. The concern is that um, the possible compromised information is in is not the entire one. You mean your entire name? Yeah, they, they have a piece of information, but it's not complete. Yeah. My entry might just complete the puzzle for them. So what, you made like one mistake, potentially? Yeah. And that could tell them everything? Yeah. Here's another worrisome development in Hong Kong. Critics of the communist authorities have been getting abducted. This in a city where people are supposed to be able to freely speak their minds. I don't have the desire to prove I'm a hero. I'm probably the most coward people you meet in your life. That's, that's why I'm doing all the precautions. And, and I think in a way of encouraging more people to act like me, it's okay to be a coward. Of course, everybody likes people being brave, but what is more realistic is people can be coward if they still make a change. So what's the, um, what's the latest, buddy? I've just decided that um, it'll be too risky to go Hong Kong for the show. Are you really disappointed? Yeah, it's like you have a newborn baby but you're not allowed to see him or her. So, just practically speaking, you're going to be directing the setup virtually, right? Yeah. I'll be filming the setup in Hong Kong. Yeah. Hello? Hi, it's Raph. Buddy, he's fucking terrified. I've managed to find his number and call him. Oh, God. He's on his way here now. Call me when he gets to you and we'll just... I, I've got... I've got... I'm not, oh, God. Yeah, what's going on? So, OK. They know who I am. They contact my family. Oh. They want me to pull out the show. Otherwise, they'll, they'll do something to me, not to my family. Yeah, they find my fucking family. They pretty know who I am. Fuck. Let me, let me speak to Tom, and let me call you back. Do safe way. Be cautious, OK? I, I, I will. I will. OK. OK, bye. Yeah, bye. Tom? Yes. Um, OK, listen, some bad stuff has happened. Buddy got a call. Um, Police went to family of his in um, China and to get the message to close the exhibition, not to go ahead with the exhibition. Oh my God. I mean, am I safe saying that, like, this has nothing to do with this event, that um, his identity was blown? I've got no idea. I don't know, I don't know his name or who he is. I've ne never. No, no, never no, 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 no. And neither do we. Fuck's sake. Buddy? Yeah? How are your family? Oh well. I need to get them out, if it's still possible. 
Just call me when you're up in the morning. I think I gotta sleep now. I'm so sorry, buddy. I'm so sorry. How you going? Hey there. Good. Good to meet. So this whole experience is great for paranoia. Yeah, I feel a little bit naive now. Uh, yeah. I don't even know if this is still necessary. Well, maybe just the, the um, beanie. I mean, like, they know me now. Yeah. So what's the purpose to hide? So obviously this is a really awful decision. Yeah, I'm just do thinking and valuing. Now I just need to focus on how to get them mm -hmm. out of there. It's dark, you know, in here, so this was going to be the stage with the projection. It's like, either, yeah. wait, wait, that's the, that's the uh, torture chair, the tiger chair. <sighs> it's a life-changing mm. situation. I and mean, how are you feeling about the fact that Buddy Artao is a an artist is potentially going on hiatus? Or is, or is he dead, I mean? To be honest, I can't think, think of that. It's, it will drag me to the abbeys. This is them. Okay. Well, I mean, Ai Weiwei has told him he thinks he should reveal himself. I, I, does Ai Weiwei have family back home? I don't know. It's also easier once you've been in the gulag in in China that they know who you are and know who everyone is. Yeah, so, once it's blown, yeah. it's blown. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hey. Hi. We should hear from you because, I mean, what, what's your inkling? Uh, yeah, I really don't know how to make this decision. If I just give up my family, do I still have a heart? If I give up myself, do I still have a heart? I just have a new information. Another member of my family has been reached by the police. It's really a no-win situation, isn't it? We, we could cancel the show and, and all of this, but that doesn't mean family are, are, are going to be just allowed to swan out and leave. And it's, it's not possible to get your family out of China between now and tomorrow night. What are you doing about the exhibition? You've got to make a decision about the exhibition. You mean now, or...? You could maybe get back to us before 12. What's the time now? It's only passed. How far away is that? 40 minutes. Uh, I've got to make a call first. She comes, she comes here. But he can't, he has a son, you know. Come on, he has, he has a son. Oh. A message from my production manager in Australia. The second relative was told by the people who visited that they would be at the exhibition. As in the Chinese authorities or... Right. Fuck's sake. <laughs> Seriously? Com coming to the exhibition. Now the only thing I, I have or I can work with is the safety of my family and, and that's not even in my hand. I have the decision to call Love the Show or not. Mm -hmm. That's a power in my hand. OK, so what's our plan? It's now 20 to 12 and we're speaking to Buddy in 20 minutes. Maybe I start filling in the team a bit. I wondered if we could have your advice, actually, and speak to you in confidence. We wanted some advice from Amnesty. I don't know if you're the man to do that. If he calls it off, well, then is family fine? Or does it make no difference, basically? So I wondered how comfortable RSF is in, in what you want to say. OK, we'll hear from you in five minutes-ish. Say that again, say that again. The family visits, you would cancel. Are you there? Yeah. OK. Buddy? Yeah. Buddy there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, there's, the decision's been taken out of your hands, buddy. With my staff, HKFP and The Hive involved as well, and the fact that yeah. we've learned that there are going to be some characters showing up tomorrow. But I, I, I guess that's it. Um, I'm sorry, there doesn't seem to be any other, you know, solution, but... Yeah. Uh, You're a very brave man, and I'm, I'm very, you know, sorry that 
all this has happened and I mean, I, I'm, we know we're going to get a lot of questions, right? And they're going to be very persistent, but we have to be very disciplined to not say anything more. No, no staff in the video, sorry. It's all off. I've got, we're about to have a media shift song because the story is going to be bigger than if we had just done it. You see that? I'm um, trying to carry that. That's me. <laughs> oh, my family is the orange can. <laughs> I'm trying to move them out. Oh, that's my epiphany moment. It's a lot of load to carry, buddy. So, I'm recording sound. Yeah. Did you say I can record picture too? To know me now. It's... Yeah. This is you. That's me. guys can recognize this face <laughs> it's uh, it's the uh, big brother cross the big sister <laughs> or big mother of Hong Kong um, well let's stare her back for a moment <laughs> I'm showing you guys my face standing with you and telling you we should fight back Lastly, I want to talk about a special new work. I'm calling it the Lennon War Flag. I want to take in the very essence of all these post notes and just simply putting them together as a new icon for Hong Kong.
Okay, guys. Thanks for watch the documentary, and, and thanks for a lot of you watch it twice, because some of some of you guys already watched it last night. Um, now, I mean, you know a lot about me. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Hong Kong, especially the documentary ended uh, with the Hong Kong protest, but also it talks about the new flag that I designed uh, for the Hong Kong protest and then hoping that could be a new identity or icon for the entire movement. Uh, I prepare some slides and uh, just allow me some time to go through it. So, okay, this is one of my uh, new cartoon that I did recently. Uh, as you can see, uh, in the middle there's three pandas and the image was referencing the very famous uh, Buddhism icon of three no. So do not look, do not listen, and do not talk. I think this is very much uh, summarizing the situation in China regarding to the free speech. Um, it is really a shame that Chinese government are not really uh, seeing the value of free speech. They do not see it as a way to promote, to, to make the society a better one, but seeing it as a threat to the so-called stability. And we have to know this is the stability for the power of Chinese government, not the stability of the entire country. And that's another version that I, that I do for Australia. Um, I've lived in Australia for more than 10 years, as you learn from the film. Uh, and Australia is a very unique country because we have a huge population from mainland China. Uh, like myself, we have 5% of population are actually uh, Chinese. So Australia become a main target for China's foreign propaganda. Uh, a lot of things happen that, uh, uh, for example, in university, uh, meaning university would not have the guts or have the courage to host an event like this because they're worrying maybe the Chinese government would think, well, this is not okay and we have invested so much money to your university, to your society. In exchange, you need to be silent on the Chinese human rights issues. So this is literally my expression of what's going on in Australia when this giant panda with the Mao time hat is trying to paint the koala into the panda look. Now let's move to uh, the situation in Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong, like the situation in Catalonia, it's never an easy uh, solution. The, the situation can be very complex, given the history of Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was this kind of colonized state, a city, for such a long time. Um, and within people's mind, there might be still a lot of you know, memory of the old time. So when the protests began, a lot of people starting to using many different flags to, to kind of uh, supporting their idea. One of the major flag that you can see will be the, the, the flag of Britain, uh, the country which is fucked up by Brexit at the moment. Um, and also, when, when those people are waving a, a foreign flag, it becomes a sting in a lot of people's eyes from China. Because it's like, oh, why do you want to betray your motherland? Why do you want rather be a colonized state from a foreign power? Uh, uh, and there's more about it, I think. Um, from my understanding, when Hong Kongers are waving other countries' flag, it does not saying they want to be a part of the. Of, or, or they want to be slave of the Western country. It's rather a remanding of the responsibility of those countries from the free world that you should value human rights wherever it is. It's Hong Kong's fight, but it is also the fight for the rest of the free world. Um, so I would rather say it's, it's asking for help, 
it's asking for the Western country to see their responsibility instead, instead of begging for help. There is this very subtle difference. And of course, you see a lot of people waving American flags. And then we heard argument from China, especially from the Chinese government, saying, oh, Hong Kong want to be the puppet of President Trump, uh, which I always refer him as the rapist and the racist. He shall not be the one who we trying to appeal uh, for help. But American in general is still one of the most powerful country in the free world. So again, this is a reminder for their responsibility instead of begging for help. And of course, you see in Hong Kong's movement, uh, this is one of the most kind of uh, self-identity uh, icon, which is this black flag. But it's not really original. Uh, the flower in the middle, or the whole uh, kind of layout of design, is a rebel to the already used uh, Hong Kong flag at the moment. So the original version is a red flag with a flower in the middle. And the Hong Kong protests transform this visual icon and make it into a, uh, a, a rejection to the old system. You can see the color change. You can see on the flowers, it's actually dying. And there are blood uh, being uh, kind of uh, splendid on, on the flower. But for me, I don't think it's really, it, it serves its purpose. It is powerful as a, as a revolution icon. But what, is, what it lacks is, um, it is not really a thing that originally from Hong Kong. It's not really about Hong Kong's identity. And also, it's really dark. Uh, when you have something is really dark, it might serve to unite people when everyone is struggling, but it creates this misunderstanding to the outside world. Because the black flag, people see it as what? Pirate, anarchy instead of a very constructive and peaceful icon for the movement. So that is why I am desperate to, to try to find material, try to find a new visual icon that maybe is a better way to represent for Hong Kongers' protest. And then what I'm thinking is the Lenin War. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Lenin War, uh, it is originated in Prague uh, around the time in 1989 when, when, when people are there are trying to uh, protest the communist tyranny by the time. And it all starts from this war. Uh, people starting to, to using the form of uh, street art to, to, you know, writing their ideas about uh, a better country. Uh, they access their freedom of speech with this form of street art. And in 2014, when the uh, umbrella movement kicking in in Hong Kong, the people in Hong Kong adapted this idea to using public space to express uh, their willing to defend their city. And the way they're doing it is using these very colorful notes. I think it's very a uh, Hong Kong way to adapt this because when we're talking about Hong Kong, we're also thinking about office, financial center. And this kind of sticky note is probably very common in every office uh, in Hong Kong. So people are just using this to paste it on the wall instead of using spray can. Um, it brings two benefits. One is Hong Kongers actually really love its city. They don't want vandalizing it unless it's, it is really necessary. So they're using sticky notes. In another word, when you want to clean the wall, it will be extremely easy. The other thing is it bringing more engagement with different group of people. If people can only do street arts, then we're talking about a very limited group of people. But for this form, for the sticky notes, any group, younger ones, older ones, office ladies, street artists, they all can enjoy in this form of expression. Uh, this is my very personal Lenin war. It happened after my show got canceled. Uh, the very night after the cancellation is announced, there are a group of uh, activists putting all my cartoons uh, 
on this uh, bookstore, which is a, a bookstore associated with Beijing government. So in a form of protest, and I'm very honored to actually have this uh, you know, personal Lenin war for me. Now in 2009, this form has been adapted all over the world, all over the place in Hong Kong, and you can see the scale growing much bigger. It's no longer just in one location. It's all around the city, and they cover this entire tunnel with the same form of pasting notes advocating for Hong Kong's freedom. And people are being very innovative. People are starting to put the, those notes on their bodies. Uh, uh, when, 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 you know, some place is kind of forbidden for people to do that. So people using their own body as a vehicle to express the idea. And this is a cartoon that actually inspired by this entire movement. But I'm thinking, you know, who should be the ones who really listen to these messages? Yes, it's great to be in the public space, but what if we can directly pasting them on the leader's back? So from this image, you can see, uh, okay, from this side is the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, and that side is Carol Long, who is the Hong Kong's leader at the moment. An art show never just be in a digital space. In that serve its very powerful uh, way, but also in the physical form, in the public space, it makes the work more accessible to the public. And this is a kind of huge mural pasted up uh, in Melbourne, uh, in the very famous street art lane called the Hosean Lane. So. I initiate uh, this kind of uh, public art or performance art by pasting my cartoon, but a different version. So you can see the difference. The one in the public space is without the, the, the colorful notes. And I'm just putting this kind of uh, empty work in the space and inviting residents from Hong Kong. Uh, in Melbourne or, or, or other Melbourne residents to join me to make it into a complete work. So now it's no longer just a drawing. It's a, a social installation in the real world that are combined with the real um, post notes. And that's just two hours after. You can see it's entirely covered. So I think this particular form is very important because it has this circle from the digital space to the real space. Um, and, and these two spaces are actually echoing to each other. They're empowering each other. And then when this art is in the public space, people will take photos, they will be reposted on Twitter, on Instagram, or on, so, on other social media. So the form, uh, the life of this form of art continuing sustains it in its own way. Um, so for this Lenin Wall idea, because I feel it's really important, it, it summarized the entire movement so well and it's so peaceful. Um, it's really good to have a relaxed time with the music. <laughs> okay, so back to this more serious picture. This is a, a picture taken in Hong Kong. So one, the police, uh, they, they have their own flag, okay? It comes with different color. Uh, from yellow to orange to red to black. Black is the worst one because that's, that's when they start to use the force. And I transfer it into a different form, which is adapting the visual experience of Lennon Wall by using those colorful square. And these are the police in Australia. <laughs> uh, they are less fierce at that moment, but police are police. They can be very brutality, uh, brutal, uh, whether they're in the free country or in more like less free country like China. Um, so I think this, this visual experience is very important. Then, then my next step is thinking, why don't I develop it into a flag to replacing um, the black flag to replacing the, the flag of uh, Great Britain, to replacing the flag of the United States, 
to giving Hong Kong its own identity, to make their uh, requirement clear. It's not about being puppy of the Western world. It's about gaining their own autonomy. And this is the, the real stuff that it has been uh, developed. And tomorrow, there will be an art performance actually about this flag. And you will see uh, a, a similar thing happened. And here is some example that I've been bringing this flag to many different places. Uh, there are ones from, well, from this side that's in Melbourne. The other side you can see actually that's a little uh, White House behind, and that's happening in the United States. Uh, this is in the Trafalgar Square in London. This very massive Lenormand flag happened in Taiwan. So I have to say that Taiwan is another very important country that is facing the same threat as Hong Kong now. Um, the Chinese government trying to propose this idea of one country, two system, and make Taiwanese to, to, to kind of believe in this agreement. So if Taiwan want to become a part of China again, they can you know, keep thriving and keep their own way of life under this structure called one country, two system. And this policy is supposed to be applied in Hong Kong supposed to be a great example um, to make it appealing and attractive to the people in Taiwan. But now it seems like it is not really working because the fundamental problem of the Chinese government is it never really keep its promises. It never really respect the rule of law, which is a spirit on uh, honoring the arrangement, the agreement, the contract. And that's what Chinese government is lacking. And that's why now we see, because this one country system is not really being performed in Hong Kong, and Hong Kongers are not getting their autonomy as they promised in 1997 when the handover happened. And that is why they have to protest in order to gaining their rights back, in order to gaining their freedom and democracy back. And this happened definitely throw a huge warning to the people in Taiwan. And that is why you can see this flag is so welcomed in Taiwan. And they love it so much to make it a, a giant one, which I um, really appreciate. So now I think the flag is really recognized by a lot of people who are supporting Hong Kong around the world. As you can see here, someone probably spent a lot of time to sewing uh, and stitching a little square into, into a huge uh, a flag, which I really respect because this means a lot of hours of labor. Um, Hong Kongers are also develop this pattern of image into different form, like origami. Um, and this is a photo taken in Hong Kong, uh, maybe about a month ago. So the students, they are middle school students, and they are also joining in the Hong Kong protest. So, so really, when you have two million people out of the streets to protest from entire eight million population, it means literally everyone is taking part in. It's not just the young students, it's, it's the university students. It's, it's now uh, in Hong Kong at the moment, they're using this new campaign called lunch protest. They are the white callers, they are the middle class, they are the rich class, the rich people, who are using their lunch break to protest in downtown uh, Hong Kong, which is another example to showing that, that this is not just about a little bunch of people, it's about the entire movement from the whole city. Last image. Um, so you can see this is a, a peaceful demonstration happening in Hong Kong. And in the middle, it is the Lenin War flag. So I'm really uh, happy and feel honored that now this flag become one of the symbols for the entire movement. And we can see that Hong Kongers have its own identity. It's not necessary for them to waving the American flag or, or, or the Britain flag. They can have their own identity. And, oh, so this is the design. 
uh, for the Land One flag, and uh, it's actually open resources online. Anybody is welcome to scan this QR code and download the design of it. Um, now, tell me if you're boring. If not, I could go a little bit more about my carton. So, just to have a little bit uh, introduction of them. This is the very first carton that I did when this anti-extraditional bill has been introduced. This is an image that referencing the tank man that we, uh, I have been revisiting for a lot of times. Uh, this particular work is called Hong Kong Picnic. Um, because in Hong Kong, the police starting to forbidden people have its right to do uh, peaceful assembly. And in Hong Kong, if you are gathering uh, for more than three people without permission, it will be seen as illegal. So the Hong Kong people starting to use this very innovative way to say, we are not doing the protest. We're doing individual picnic in front of the government. So everyone will not really coming in the group. They might just bring in one thing and eating lunch or pretending they're doing the picnic. But actually, it's a different form of protest. Um, there are a lot of brave individuals are on, in the front line to, to try to protect uh, the people in the back who are doing more peaceful demonstration. And that is also, you know, a lot of media are depicting to saying the frontline protests are so violent because they clash with the policemen. But you have to understand these young kids, their motivation is not causing harm to anyone. They simply want to delay in the march of the policemen. So the protest, the peaceful protest behind them can have more time to fleeing away from the violence, to fleeing away from the harm of the tear gas, uh, the water cannon, the paper spray, the, the rubber bullets, and now even the life round, the real bullets, guns. And of course, police brutality is very serious in Hong Kong now. We actually have a case for the protesters being killed because of police using their violence. Um, there are a lot of cases showing Hong Kong protesters are being abused after they got uh, detained, especially in the detention center. Uh, just a couple days ago, there is an utterly disgusting case. There might be a girl who's only 15 years old, um, and she got arrested, and she says she got raped in the police station by several policemen, and she actually got pregnant because of that. Uh, you have to know this, uh, it probably happened in the very beginning of the protest. Now we're into the fifth month. So, so that is entirely possible and logic this thing might happen. But it's just showing now the Hong Kong is really in this critical moment that um, within, you know, Hong Kong, now Hong Kong, the most Hong Kong people are looking for these five demands, um, which are firstly, withdraw the extraditional bill which has been done. Secondly, pardon all the protester who has been arrested. Thirdly, establish a independent uh, investigation group to look into the brutality of the policemen. So the police force will be checked within their power. At this moment, the police on, in the field, they're not even showing their identity. Everyone was wearing a mask. Everyone do not have their identity card being showed, which before this, the law require all the policemen have this badge. So we know they're policemen. We know they're not someone pretending. It. But the Hong Kong police has been refusing to doing that. And because there's no external power to really checking in their abusement, so the one who are breaking law now are actually the Hong Kong police. Uh, also, uh, the rest of the uh, requirement is uh, the Hong Kongers want to universal suffrage uh, election, which means they want the, the full democracy instead of a fake one, the controlled one by Beijing. Um, this is the image of Carrie Lam, who is the leader of Hong Kong at the moment. Uh, 
In one of the interviews she did on Hong Kong TV, she cried, saying she's really sorry for what is happening. But we cannot believe in politicians just for what they're saying or what their tears showing. It's really their action. If they are lacking of action, if they do not really willing to solve the problem, do not have the spirit to showing they want to um, de-escalate the situation, it's really fake. So in the, the, this cartoon, you will see Caroline was being uh, pictured as a crocodile. It's a very subtle way to do it because only her hand is showing she's a cold blood reptile. Um, this is another very heavy cartoon that I did. This is the first one uh, in the entire movement who actually uh, killed himself. He can no longer stand the stress, the de desperation uh, with the political atmosphere in Hong Kong. Um, so in one night, he, he chose to end his life by jumping from a, from a, a building. Um, there's a new uh, statics showing from the June to September, which is the first three months of the protest. There are around 300 people killed themselves, um, and there are about 2,500 plus deaths happening in Hong Kong. And the same period of time last year, the number might be only 10% of this new figure. So it means the whole movement is really bring down people's uh, spirit or bring down people's mental health status. And it is really critical for everyone who are in Hong Kong at the moment. It also reflecting the situation there is not getting better. And of course, there's a lot of people are calling Carol Leung, the character, uh, the leader of Hong Kong, being resigned because she is the one who's really responsible for it. Or maybe she's not because there is a lot of argument to saying she might only be the puppet of Beijing's power. And Carrie does not really care. She celebrates when people are dying on the street. She pretending nothing has happened. She go to uh, this kind of party to showing her happiness. But where is the responsibility of this politician? Where is the responsibility of this so-called elected, elected leader? This is another example to showing when you do not really have the real democracy, the leader that you will have for the country or the, for the region or for the city will not really be responsible for your um, people. Um, these are just some other cartoons that I did. I think uh, we will just go through it gradually because uh, I've really talked a lot. Um, I actually would really like to hear something about you, especially your questions. Uh, this, this last cartoon uh, will be the one that I want to actually introduce. This is the one that I did on the plan to fly to uh, Barcelona. Uh, this is referencing on what happened in the China University of Hong Kong. So the police has kind of invaded in university space in Hong Kong now because they realize the root of protests is beginning in the universities. I think a lot of people in Catalonia region would agree on this as well. And uh, so they attack those students in the universities. They even releasing the tear gas in the playground. They completely changed the scene of a peaceful university into a battleground, which is really pathetic and sad to see. But those students are hanging there, defending their university, regardless of the price they have to pay. There are a lot of students has been arrested. There are a lot of students has been harmed by the force of the police, but they did not giving up. So that is why I created this cartoon to showing my support to them and telling them, hang on there, because what they're doing is right. So we will win eventually. And now uh, I'd like to give the time back to you and uh, welcome for any questions. And uh, I do notice that here we have uh, several students, uh, probably from mainland China. Um, I think 
you are the most welcome guest to me um, because I, I am one of you and uh, I'm welcome uh, for you to ask any questions, uh, even it is challenging my point, and I will try my best to answer that. No sé si algú té alguna cosa a dir. Passi al micro aquí, per si... I think um, as an artist, it's very important for art. Well, I am not happy with politicians just like you, and I am not happy with artists either. <laughs> because I know, uh, especially uh, even in the Western country, uh, a lot of people in the art industry have this idea that art should be for the sake of art. Um, through my interaction of a lot of people from the art world, people ask me, yes, I love your activism, but where is your art? My art is my activism. Um, for many people, I think we need to extend the understanding of art. What is art? Art is about being different. Art is about expanding the territory outside of the box, outside of our understanding of what art was. And now, I think, with this global crisis is happening, it's not just in Hong Kong, it's not just the, the Chinese government's threat. It's what happened in Europe for the uh, refugee crisis, it, what happened in the Middle East, what happened in America when they elected such a horrible president. It's what happened in, in, in Britain when, when such a beautiful country become an idiot that messed up themselves with Brexit. So art should engage them with this reality more often than before. There's no excuse for artists saying, I just want hiding in my little community and doing beautiful things. Because I believe responsibility comes with power. Power comes with responsibility. This is not just for politicians. This is for every figure in our society. Rich people, yes. Artists, yes. Because we as an artist, we do have a lot of resources in the, in the society. We have a lot of influence on people. We have beautiful galleries to show our works. We have uh, TV or concerts to do the musicians. Um, but when we are giving all those resources, but if artists is not really engaging with in politics, in reality, in the very struggle of human condition, then we are failing our power. We giving up our responsibility. So, so I think art is very important in a role to shaping people's idea because it is very influential, emotionally, rationally. Um, for example, when people go to a gallery, I assume people still go there <laughs> because a lot of people are refusing to go. Because art is so, now, con especially for contemporary art, it is so different 
so, so different, so distant from its audience, it becomes self-indulgent piece of work. It can be interpreted in any way, but in another world, it says nothing. If it is only about yourself, why do you put it in a public space? You're wasting public resources. And that is my question for the contemporary arts. That is why I try to use my art to engage with the public as much as I can, to make it accessible to the public as much as I can, by introducing form of performance or art that can be used by anyone who do not need art training at all. But you can be an artist, you can do art. I want to create formulas to engage publics, and I think it's very important. This should be the new development of the art world, and I do hope more artists and people who love art would join me. But I will still have to say that there is a difference between artists and politician. We artists towards the social responsibility, we do not really solve the problems. We use our art to expose problems in the society. We raise awareness on certain issues, whether it's in the history, like the Tiananmen Massacre, which has been kind of forgot in China, or the current issues that people are overlooking. We shall be the ones be vigilant on those issues and try and bring people's attention back to those issues. But we are not in the position to giving solutions. And as you all know, that if you want artists to become a president, it probably will not be a good way to do it. Um, that is the job for the politician. That is the job for the po uh, political system. That is the job for democracy. But what art can do is remind the society we are sick. This is not healthy system. And you need to open your eyes. You need to watch back to your politicians. Um, someone wants to talk and do other questions. Okay, um, I have to say, that, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we know we're probably running late a little bit, but I do not really have any uh, arrangement in the afternoon. So if you guys do not really feel bored with me, uh, feel welcome to stay longer. Okay. I would uh, ask a question, then you could think about your questions. <laughs> um, thank you, really. Thank you for everything you were doing and you are doing, because I think uh, it's very, very important, and congratulations. Um, uh, uh, my question or my reflection is, okay, you are, uh, do you think, or which is your, what is your experience in the more democratic world with uh, all these uh, politicians and in general the atmosphere where we had, I'm from the former Yugoslavia, but I'm living uh, here in Spain uh, since 1991. And what we see, even in the university, that we live with a kind of society where also um, uh, in the Western world, even the young people, it's a system which some, somehow, um, uh, how to explain it in English, um, uh, we are very passive, you know, even at the university. Yeah. You have all this movement now, but even the artist here, you don't have, okay, Banksy, it's a very good example, but I think that we, we could compare you with, with Banksy, but he, I think that he was always more safe than you. you yeah. know, it's the other kind of. But you think, uh, I see also the other kind of problems here. And my experience from the Yugoslavia uh, time of experience and the war and conflict to now all what's happened also in Hong Kong, this kind of hypocrisy in the Western world, you know, the politics, they don't mind really what's happening in Catalonia or in Hong Kong and so on. And also, not, it's not only the politic, also the society somehow in this capitalism uh, will live 
in such kind of, you know, uh, amnesia. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I think, firstly, maybe I want to talk a little bit about Banksy. <laughs> I know a lot of people are trying to compare me with him or her, I don't know, uh, to saying, oh, you're the Banksy from China. But I have an issue with Banksy myself. Well, he definitely packaging, let's just assume it's a him, OK? He definitely packaged him as a political artist, uh, as a kind of human rights defender. But uh, I think my problem with his work is he really, really do works is specific. Specific is powerful. Specific is dangerous. Specific is meaning. Um, I really appreciate that sometimes he do works advocating for uh, political prisoners. And he uh, did some work about uh, the situation in Palestine. Um, but apart from those works, most of his creation is very bland and general. So uh, in another word, it's always about love and peace. Everybody celebrates it, loves it. But the problem is it does not step on anyone's foot. It does not hurting the power. It does not hurting the one who are creating the problem. So in this sense, uh, I feel it's kind of, uh, it's just not sincere enough. And uh, I do hope in the future he might change his uh, strategy to dealing with those issues. I do hope in the future he could do some art about China if he really think he's an artist for human rights. For the second question, like uh, for my understanding of the Western democratic society, um, when the Soviet Union collapse, you know, uh, the uh, American scholar, the uh, Japanese American scholar, uh, I forgot his name, but this, yes, Fukuyama said that the history ha has end, but has it? Apparently not. But this quote, I guess, settled in a lot of people's minds. They think the good time has come. There's no more global crisis which we're facing can be compared with the Cold War. But look at the world now. <coughs> Not just political, environmental issues, global warnings that we're all facing this. But I guess the Western civilization or, or the democratic world has been enjoying this privilege of life for so long that we forget how important democracy is. Um, I don't know much about other countries, but I can talk a little bit about the situation in Australia. In Australia, it's compulsory to vote. So if you don't vote, the, the government or, or, or the, the committee of the election will send you fine. You will be fined for 20 U, uh, Australian dollars if you don't go to vote. But still, people don't go to vote. And the people who actually go vote, they might just you know, tick box. They're not really spending their time on research what are the politicians, their election. Um, and I think a lot of people are doing that. This sounds funny, but it's causing a very huge problem. Because when you do not really value this right, where people in China do not have, where people in North Korea do not have, where people in a lot of tyranny controlled country do not have, there's a price to pay. And now I think the Western country is paying for that. Um, also in Australia, um, because life is so easy, because there's so many resources, because the social wealth system is so good, so um, people do not really have the stress in the life. People start to not valuing knowledge as much as it can be. Because when a university graduates cannot earn more money than a, 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 a cleaner or a mining workers, why do people really want to go to university and study? But when that happened in general in very rich society, it does causing decline of the political awareness in the whole population. I guess this question also happened in America. We all know in America, for public education, the students have to pay so much 
as educational debit. So that probably will strip away a lot of people's opportunity to study in universities. And that creates a big group of people who are not educated enough to be able to judge when they need to choose their leaders. And then boom, we have Donald Trump. So this is problematic, and I am completely agree with you. Um, and this is why things like this, uh, I mean, lecture like this or communication like this is very important. I have confidence in that. I'll tell you one example. You know, in the film, we, uh, uh, we talked a, a lot about Liu Xia, uh, the widow of Chinese peace, uh, Nobel Peace winner of Liu Xiaobo. Um, when she is under the house arrest in China, somehow she saw my cartoon for her. I am talking about the most controlled dissident in China. So if she has the access to my work, I believe there will be a lot of people be able to see my work. The problem is the situation in China is very tight and controlled. And the people who want to speak differently, who want to even see things differently, will have to pay huge price. So that is why you see the, the entire country is quite silent, apart from this noise of ultranationalism which might be the result of the propaganda system instead of really reflecting what Chinese people are thinking. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but it has been perceived as the majority of people's idea in China. But I don't believe it. I still believe people in general understanding what is going on in this country, but just because it's too dangerous to speak up, so not many people are doing that. And. Uh, Come on, my Chinese friend. Any questions? But I understand if you have concern to ask question, um, because uh, please remember this: students who are outside of China are also under monitoring, threat, manipulation. So I assume if one of my fellow Chinese friends here asking something is not making China very happy they could easily put themselves into danger as well. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, if you have concern to ask me question publicly, I'm happy to have more discussion with you privately if that's safer. Sure. I think if maybe you can speak speak Spanish and someone here will be very kind to translate. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yes. Um, I think like uh, 
this will be interesting because uh, when I'm thinking if I have children in the future, then they will be the second generation of Chinese who will be born in Australia, or, or, or at least it's it, it probably not possible in, in China. Um, I think the second generation Chinese can perform as bridge, the connecting China with the world, because we we have we can have different identity. That uh, if you're born in Spain, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, it does not mean you can only be the people here. That you still have your heritage back in China. You have the look. You you probably uh, know how to speak Chinese if if your parents do speak in Chinese in the family, and I think the group of people like that is very important because you have uh, the freedom outside of China, but you also will have a lot of access back to China. You will have better understanding of China, probably better than, uh, let's say, locals who, who are not Chinese heritage. So, so this is important, and, and I am very interested in communication with second generation or southern generation of Chinese who, who are living outside of China. Um, because I know a lot of, actually, a lot of young second generation Chinese are thinking maybe they want to go back to China to, for development or, or just you know, trace back the route to see what kind of country and society it is uh, when your parents or your grandparents was born. Um, and then you suddenly were facing a lot of challenge as well. Um, but I think it's all good. So, so, so you can have a better understanding of who you are and what you want to do. And you definitely in a position by both be contribute to span to, to the local society, but also contribute to China. And maybe, you know, trigger change because your mindset will be different. And uh, you probably will be braver than, than, than other Chinese people when you do not have family in China anymore. Um, so the second question is, uh, I do hope uh, like the Chinese in Europe uh, would understand and appreciate and recognize my work more because there's less concern about being threat from Chinese government. Um, but for the ones who are in China, there are a lot of difficulty they're facing. Firstly, the censorship. So the censorship creating this kind of bubble, um, which makes them very hard to accept different opinion, because there is no different opinion allowed in China. So maybe when they are seeing my work, they will feel difficult. But any change requires time, especially when kids grow up in China it's kind of brainwash system being from the very beginning of the education. And the way they do it is not just content. It's not just the teachers of the school telling you you must love the Communist Party of China, you must love this country. It's also the form of teaching. Because um, I think my friends here who, who study in China will have better understanding of me because, you know, I'm, I'm like 10 years older than you, so maybe my understanding of Chinese education system can be outdated. But when I grow up, uh, every classroom will be like 50, 60 students. So a lot of people are there. And it is almost impossible to do way uh, as fashion of seminar or discussion. It's always just teacher telling you what to do and you remember whatever the teacher told you. With this form of education, there's no way you can really cultivate independent thinker. You cannot really teach people to think critically when you're not giving students chance to challenge the teacher. So those kids who grow up in that environment, maybe they will feel hard to see some of my art because my art sometimes can be very direct on criticizing the Chinese government. But if I may to give them a message that all my work is never about humiliating China or betraying China. I love China, and that is why I criticize that government, because I think that government is problematic. But it does not mean I hate people in China. It does not mean, it does not mean I hate the nation. It's actually out of love. Okay. Sure. 
from no photo, video. I have a question. I'm not from this master. I have a friend from this class, and uh, I studied in the designing school in uh, in the other side of Barcelona. Okay. And we are like cre creators. Yeah. So as a creator, I come here because I also feel more safe and more uh, more open to create things than in China. Mm. But we create things, so it's n like just you said that we don't hate our country because mm -hmm. we love our country and we criticize and we criticize our country because we want it to be better place yeah. for everyone. Yeah. But I have like I have one point to maybe it's been it's it's gonna be a little bit challenging for you. Uh, please, your point. please, it's most welcome. I live near Hong Kong. Yeah. And I've been writing a script about what what has been happening in Hong Kong. I've been in Hong Kong so many times. I witnessed two manifestations in, in August. Is that not only the police officers are attacking those protesters, mm. the violence is mutual. Even though all the social media, or like social media or the, the, the television network, they are like this, they are like on the side of the government, the police, they're only reporting how police officers are using, using rifles or rubber, rubber Bullet. bullets. Yeah. The violence is mutual. We also see that they're using umbrellas, like they're hiding themselves, mm -hmm. but inside of the umbrella, there are knives. They're using the umbrella. They're using all of the all of the things like the bricks they can use to attack, yeah. to randomly attack pedestrians to okay. to set the, tr the, the 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 underground station on fire. Yeah. So I just and they are like just you said like a girl was gang raped in the police station, but it's still under the under investigation. It's not. We we don't even know if that's true. And the number you, you just mentioned, like 300 people suicide during this period. Three months. It's, I think we should look at these things more critically. Like we don't know the source of this. We okay. don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. I live there, so I've been worrying what will happen in my city mm. that is super near to Hong Kong. I love Hong Kong because there are more liberty in Hong Kong, like you're free to speech yeah. and everything in Taiwan. So it's the violence. So what do you think about the, the mutual violence in Hong yeah. Kong? That's my question. Okay. Um, firstly, I condemn violence from both parties. And uh, some incidents, like I remember uh, when the protesters are occupying the Hong Kong airport, they find someone who might be a mob or, or who might not really come from the protest group, but uh, that guy was being there and turned out he's a journalist from a Chinese media. So the protester tied him up and beat him. And he made this very famous quote, something like, I love Hong Kong, please, now you can beat me. And he become a hero back in mainland China. That violence is totally unnecessary and disgusting. But what I want to say is, firstly, actually, there are representatives from the protesters apologize after this incident. And they do realize this is not the good way to do it. This is not the right way to do it. Um, but. I will have to say that uh, it's very important to see the root of the violence. I think you, uh, because you say your city is very close to Hong Kong, maybe you, you keep track with the Hong Kong protest. In the very beginning of the protest, I don't think there is any violence, right? Um, uh, when, when the Hong Kongers having this a million protesters, this is mainly just very calm for. But it started by the Hong Kong police who are cracking down the protests in the beginning. And then it's not just the police who are doing it. The police are collaborating with triads, mafias in Hong Kong. And these mafias go on the streets. They're all wearing white, 
which is like a juxtaposition to the protesters who are wearing black. So these mafias go on the streets, randomly attack protesters. And so many people got beaten up. And the police were just there, do nothing. And after that, the protesters starting to grow into different groups. There are ones called the Heli Fei Fei, which means the peaceful group. There are ones called the Yong Wu, uh, which means the brave and, and, and brave with force. So for the brave with force group, I have to say maybe there's only maybe 100 compared with this a million uh, peaceful protests. It's really just a tiny bit of it, maybe a couple hundred, I don't know. But that began because of the police use the violence first, because police do nothing when the tribes are attacking passengers in the first. And that's the root of it. And the solution to end this violence keep being escalated. The Hong Kongers has made it very clear. We need independent investigation groups to look into police brutality, to look into uh, the police dodging their responsibility on protecting protesters when they got attacked by the triads. But police are not doing it. So tell me what else can Hong Kongers, can Hong Kong protesters do to protect themselves when they are attacked? And we have to understand this is a very devastating moment. And the protesters are human beings as well. They're not Gandhis. We have one Gandhi in our entire human history. You can't require everyone be on the ground, be Gandhi, to accept being slaughtered without any protection. And sometimes people, people getting angry. People become outrageous. And that explains why sometimes protests are trying to revenge themselves. And uh, I, from my understanding, I haven't seen a case that uh, those kind of armed protests are randomly attacking uh, just passengers on the street because that makes no sense to doing that. Usually what they do, they, they sometimes do revenge people when they find out that people or that person is a member of the mafia in Hong Kong. But I don't see them randomly attacking residents because look, why do they do that? It, it makes no sense. It does not really help in the protest. But also, you have to understand, in Hong Kong, for, for, for the police, uh, that is a fact that the police is dressing like protesters to sometimes disturbing the things up. And I don't know if that's possible. Maybe it is the policemen who start the violence but in pretending themselves as protesters. Um, and also, yes, there are a lot of protests are burning down shops, burning down subway stations. But there is a reason behind it. Firstly, you see those protesters, maybe they were stoning shops, bakeries, but they only do that because those shops are pro-China. Those shops are saying, uh, protests suppose uh, they, they deserve to be beaten to death by the police. And that's the political motivation behind those vandalism. But they never take any bread from the bakery. <laughs> so it's not economic motivation. It is clearly a political gesture. And why are they burning down the metro station? That is because the metro station collaborates with the police. Um, they refuse to giving up the CCTV footage uh, on the night of 31 of July, when the police closing down one of the metro station and beating up a lot of protesters. And the rumors are saying people die from that night. But the metro station, the metro company refused to public the CCTV footage to showing what really happened. And also, the metro company closing down the surface in order to helping the police force moving faster in the city. So they become police express instead of public traffic system. And that is why people are burning down the metro station.
because now they believe these metro stations are actually functioning as extending of police force. Um, but, but I do wear that there is violence from both sides. But still, we have to know knife cannot really compare with guns. The, 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 the difference of the force is so different, and the, dum the number of the people from the both sides is so different. I, I hope uh, I answer your question. Thank you. Uh, well, thank, thanks for your... Uh, are there more, more questions there? No, no, yeah. No, no, no. No, I was just Please wondering ask. whether really to make a question or not, because it's a bit late, so this is why. If someone else wants to, of, of the students wants to ask, maybe... Maybe we can do the last Maybe question. the last yeah, one. Now, sure, my, yes. I just want to congratulate you for your work <laughs> and, and you, your courage, and this is a privilege to have this kind of talks here. I'll maybe just ask, is your family okay? Ah. <laughs> Instead of pl placing like more complicated question that might take long uh, time, yeah. So um, well, this is actually a tough question um, because actually the more I share, the more they might be in danger. Um, there's not much I can do to really help everyone in China because what happened is not just my close family, even my extended family got harassed by the police. And there's just no way I move everyone out of China. It's not practical. And I was joking with my friend, if, let's say, my extended uncle has a dog in the family, the police will visit the dog as well. So it is a hard situation. But I'm not the only one who are suffering from this. There are a lot of people who are doing that. And the only way to kind of um, solve this Christ, uh, problem or, or, or threat once for all is China change. Is, is, is the government reform itself? Is, is China become a democratic and free country? Without that being achieved, no one is really safe. I mean, yes, it happened to my family, but it could happen to any family. Um, so, thank you. Okay, um, I just have to say thank you very much to come sure. here with us. And I want to remember that tomorrow at 12.30 is going to be a performance in Plaza San Jaume um, that is going to organize for Emma um, Badikau. And also tomorrow in the TV3 program, The Preguntas Frequents, um, is going to have an interview, but you guys don't have to uh, interview in the, in, the program, in the program. So thank you very much, sure. Joaquim. Um, also, lastly, I actually bring some little artwork. It's available for you to buy if you're interested. I will set it up outside. Okay, thank you. Thank you.